Yo, what's up, guys? Alf here, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I've recently used to hit rank 1 with on the Arena Ladder. Uh, as you can see from the screenshot here, I'm currently 39 and 10 with this list, uh, and a few of those losses were definitely punts on my part as I was trying to figure the deck out as well, so it's been performing really well for me so far. And now, before I get into it, there'll be a link down in the description with the importable deck list if you want to try it out for yourself. And I'm also started writing an article about this deck that'll be up, hopefully, sometime next week on MTGA's in Premium that'll have full details, uh, you know, a sideboard guide, some tips and tricks to help play the deck as well so if you're a premium member definitely keep your eyes out for that and i'll have a link to that down in the description once it releases as well but anyway with that all out of the way this is my red black bombardment vampire sacrifice deck in historic so sorin and vein ripper has obviously been tearing it up in a bunch of different constructed formats recently like explorer and i've been trying it out in timeless as well recently and i finally got around to testing it in historic and i thought it'd be a really nice addition to the red black midrange deck because red black midrange has definitely been on a downswing in historic for quite a while now you know the main reason to run that deck used to be that you preyed on decks like Wizards, for example, that used to be weak to a lot of interaction. But now with the stock list running for Flame of an Orf for expressive iteration, they can grind really well against you. Um, is it Phoenix has also been on the upswing recently, which, you know, with the printing of Treasure Cruise, enables them to grind really well against you as well. And then decks like Mono Green Devotion have always been a really terrible matchup for Red Black Midrange as well. So I was hoping that Sorin Vein Ripper would be a nice boost to that archetype, giving you a much more powerful, proactive game plan. And it, I definitely do think it does improve the deck. And I do think Red Black midrange with Sorin and Vein Ripper is a good build for sure, but I didn't really feel like it fixed any of those core issues that I was talking about. The decks that go bigger or wider than you, like Monogreen Devotion, like uh, Boris Convoke, um, all still feel like really tricky matchups. The Is It decks are still very tricky as well because Wizards is running four copies of Flame of Anor in the main deck, which can cleanly kill the Vein Ripper. Obviously, they have to sack a creature instead, but they can often win through that. And then the Is It Phoenix decks are often running four Lightning Axe in the main deck as well, which gives them a way to deal with Vein Ripper in the main deck as well. And then additionally, you've got stuff like Kapala's Absan Yorgmoth deck, which I think Vein Ripper is really nice against them, especially game one because it stops them using Yorgmoth because obviously it drains two whenever they sack a creature. But you know, post sideboard when they have like four pylon and then they can call of calling for Skyfisher Spider and their very go wide game plan is, is generally good against all your single target removal. I just felt like even with Sorin Vein Ripper, there was still a lot of matchups that I was scared of and were, you know, kind of difficult to win consistently, if that makes sense. So I wanted to try it in another shell and I was really intrigued by running Sorin Vein Ripper alongside Goblin Bombardment, mainly because it just gives you a way to close the game out so much faster because obviously the, the, the passive on Vein Ripper is really nice if you're running a bunch of removal, but if you're running a bunch of small creatures and Goblin Bombardment, you can just close the game out so quickly because every creature that you sacrifice with the Bombardment represents three direct damage because of the Vein Ripper, which, you know, like I said, just presents such a fast clock. And also there's some really nice crossover synergies between Bombardment and Sorin as well. You know, a lot of the Sorin decks want to be running cards like Bloodgast because... Bloodgast enables you to consistently use the Lightning Helix mode every single turn as long as you keep drawing lands. And Goblin Bombardment works super well with the Bloodgast, you know, in addition to that. And then also you want to be running cards like Voldar and Epica, which are also vampires. So I felt like there was really good crossover synergies between Goblin Bombardment <coughs> and Sorin and Vein Ripper. And it's definitely felt a lot better to me. I think you close games out a lot quicker. You have really good reach, which gives you a much better matchup against decks like uh, Monogreen Devotion. Then the Go Wide decks with a bunch of small creatures, like, like I said, the, the the Yorgmoth deck and um, stuff like Boris Convoke, you can deal with much more easily because of Bombardment as well. So this has definitely felt like the best build of Sorin Vein Ripper that I've tried in Historic, and the deck has felt like it has really good game plans for every single matchup in the format. So next up we'll have a look at some of the individual cards in the deck. So Sorin and Vein Ripper is obviously one of the main synergies in the deck. The idea here is we can get Sorin down as early as turn 3, and then use the minus 3 to cheat the Vein Ripper into play, and this is such a powerful card to get down early because a 6-5 flying body is really difficult to attack past, so if you're up against an aggro deck like Wizards or Convoke, or uh, is it Phoenix, for example, it's really difficult for them to attack past, and if they do attack into it and you start blocking, you drain them a bunch, which gains you a bunch of life back as creatures die in combat, which is really nice at stabilizing you as well. Then if the Sorin survives and you get to untap, you can use the plus one to turn this into a 7-6 flying lifelinker, and if you can connect with that, a 7-point life swing is so, so big against the aggro decks, and almost always just stabilizes you on the spot. Then on offense, it's also a really big creature, you know, like I said, you can turn it into a 7-6 flying lifelinker if the Sorin survives, and that's a 
immediately a 310 clock if the even if the opponent hasn't taken any damage so far from anything else so really nice on offense as well and then ward sacrifice a creature is also such a big deal on this card as well because at absolute worst it still c kills one of the opponent's creatures and drains them for four so if you are against a deck like is it wizards for example they still have to sack a creature and drain for four which is really good at stabilizing you there as well but you can also fizzle their removal spell if you kill their creatures in response so if you've got a bombardment in play or a fatal push in hand for example if you kill all their creatures in response to the war trigger it fizzles it which is such a blowout because not only do you get to drain them a bunch as you kill their creatures with your removal but the vein ripple gets to stick about which almost always is just going to kill them on the crackback as well and then against control which is normally the kind of archetype that would be able to deal with these big creatures more efficiently they really struggle to deal with this unless they have something like a supreme verdict because they don't run many creatures unless they have something like a wandering emperor or a shark typhoon they're not going to have a creature in play to be able to pay for the war trigger on this so this is also a really solid you know threat against control if you can get it down game one which is a pretty big deal then outside of that Soren has also got some other really nice abilities um we can obviously buff the Vein Ripper to turn it into a 7-6 Lifelinker as well. We can also do that with Voldar and Epicure and Bloodgast because these are both vampires in the deck as well. But the, you've also got the Lightning Helix ability on this, which is really big, not only to give us additional reach. You know, obviously we are a sacrifice deck that's going to be dealing a bunch of direct damage off cards like Goblin Bombardment. So being able to use the Helix ability to deal three directly to the opponent is going to be a really good way to close the game out. But it's also really good at taking out creatures as well, especially against a deck like Is It Wizards, which is still probably the most popular deck in the format from my experience. Sorin just works so nicely as a way to just kill any of their creatures because none of their creatures have more than three toughness and gain you three life back as well. And that's particularly good with Bloodgast, right? If we can get Bloodgast down on turn two, then go Sorin immediately sacrifice the Bloodgast to kill one of their creatures, then we can play a land drop, get the Bloodgast back again, sacrifice the Bloodgast again to kill the Sorin, and it's a plus ability as well, so this is ticking up the loyalty to five or six, which is pretty difficult for the Wizards deck to, to kill, unless they like have Symmetry Sage into Reckless Charge, for example, so the Helix mode and the Lifelink mode are both really good with Bloodgast and Epicure as well. Then Vein Ripper outside of Sorin is pretty hard castable in this deck as well because of Deadly Dispute. Deadly Dispute is a really nice sack outlet, I'm going to talk about this in more detail in a little bit, but we can get Vein Ripper down on turn 4 if we have like Shambling Ghast into Deadly Dispute as well and this deck is very good at playing into long games you know this is quite a grindy deck as most sacrifice decks are so oftentimes you can just get to 6 mana or get to 6 lands in play anyway and then just hard cast the Vein Ripper so unlike a lot of decks that are running Sorin Vein Ripper this deck can also hard cast it fairly consistently as well which is pretty powerful so the other main engine card in the deck is Goblin Bombardment and this card is really strong and it's basically good in every single matchup because if you're up against a creature deck you can use this to ping down the opponent's creatures which gives you access to additional removal and slows down the opponent's proactive game plan which is really nice but outside of that you can also just go face with this which gives you really good reach in the late game and enables you to close games out pretty quickly especially if you have it alongside Vein Ripper. Like I said if you can assemble these two cards together you can close out games so fast which massively improves the matchup against Mono Green Devotion which is typically a matchup that these fair decks really tend to struggle against but just in general against any deck if you're on the back foot and you have a bombardment in play and you manage to get a Vein Ripper in play off either a Sorin or by hard casting it you can often just kill the opponent straight away because every creature you sacrifice is just three damage including the vein ripper itself so this gives you really good reach so obviously for the bombardment to be good you do need to have a lot of cheap creatures to be able to sacrifice to it so we've got voldar and epicure here which is a vampire so it works very nicely with both modes on sorin but it also pings on etb which it gives you additional reach very, works very nicely with a direct ga damage game plan and it creates a blood token as well which gives you extra fuel to sacrifice to the deadly dispute and also works very well with blood ghast right we can go voldar and epicure on turn one crack the blood to put blood ghast in the graveyard then play a land to bring it back and it's also just good at fixing our hand you know this deck is very grindy you do play a lot of long games and so being able to loot away lands when you don't need them just to try and find extra gas is pretty huge there as well then we've got unlucky witness which is really good at ensuring we don't run out of gas and it's just the best sacrifice fodder to keep digging for more cards as well works very nicely with bombardment and deadly dispute and is also very good at finding Sorin on turn 3. So if, for example, we have a Vein Ripper in hand, if we go Unlucky Witness on turn 1, into Deadly Disp Dispute on turn 2, we have 4 extra looks at finding Sorin for that very powerful turn 3 play as well. So Unlucky Witness, just great at en enabling us to grind into longer games, and is also very nice at just helping us assemble synergies like Sorin Vein Ripper, or helping us find very powerful cards like Goblin Bombardment or Season Pyromancer. Then Shambling Ghast, another really nice card to sacrifice. Like I said, Shambling Ghast, Deadly Dispute gives us 2 treasures which enables us to hard 
Stratocaster. Vein Ripper on turn four, which is pretty nice. The minus one, minus one ability is also very relevant against creature decks, especially a deck like Is It Wizards, where Goblin Bombardment can sometimes be too slow because you can obviously sacrifice the gas to the Bombardment, ping a creature, and then give it minus one, minus one off the Shambling Gas. So it kind of acts as two creatures against decks like that, which is pretty big. And then the treasure token outside of Vein Ripper, this is a very mana hungry deck in general. We have a lot of stuff to do with our mana. Season Pyromancer is great at, you know, helping us refuel and also is a ma nice mana sink in itself. Deadly Dispute keeps the cards flowing as well and then we do have some mana sinks in the mana base as well so we're always going to have good use for the treasure tokens. Plus like I said very nice at hard casting the Vein Ripper. And then Bloodgast works all very nicely with Sorin, but also works similarly well with the Goblin Bombardment as, as well, because we can sacrifice it to the Bombardment, play a land, bring it back, sacrifice it again. So really, really nice synergies going on here as well. Then it also gets haste once the opponent's at 10 or less life, so another way for us to apply pressure to the opponent's life total, especially against control, this is a really big deal, because typically these style of sacrifice decks tend to struggle against control because you don't close the games out as quickly as the aggro decks do, which often gives them time to, you know, get their Teferis and stuff online, but it's very easy for us to get the opponent down to 10 life and then having this very recursive hasty threat is really really difficult for, for them to deal with unless they have divine purge which is pretty big as well so bloodgast is such a you know a central card in this deck because it works very nicely with with both of our key game plans and then season pyromancer one of the best cards in the deck as well you know this helps first of all grind right this is very good at ensuring that we don't run out of gas particularly in matchups against the other grinding decks like rakdos midrange for example because if you're empty handed with this you can just cast it immediately draw two it's also very nice with cards that you want to discard like the Bloodgast for example get it into the graveyard on turn 3 and it also produces tokens as well so if we go Season Pyromancer, discard 2 non-lands we get 3 um bodies on the battlefield which gives us three things to sacrifice with the bombardment which is really big as well and then once it's in the graveyard we can also then pay five to get two more tokens so very very good card on its own right even even without any of the other synergies going on season pyromancer is a powerful card but because of all the bodies it produces it's really nice with bombardment fuels the graveyard really nice when you're empty handed so season pyromancer is kind of the perfect card to go along with this deck then we've also got deadly dispute as an additional sacrifice outlet to turn on cards like unlucky witness and shambling gas which is pretty big again how helps keep our hand going, you know, is a good way for us to refuel. Treasure token is great at hard casting the Vein Ripper or just providing us with extra treasures. And then, like I said, very nice at helping us assemble the Sorin Vein Ripper for turn three as well. So because this deck has so many ways to dig in the early few turns, it assembles Sorin Vein Ripper on turn three a lot more consistently than decks like Rakdos Midrange, for example. And we've also got four copies of Fatal Push. So initially I wasn't sure that I wanted the full four copies, but because we've got Goblin Bombardment as a way to pick off the opponent's creatures, but specifically the Is It Wizards matchup, it's so important to kill their creatures quickly and bombardment is very difficult to get three creatures in play quick enough to take out the, the opponent's creatures so I felt like for fatal push in the main deck was important there and then there are a lot of other matchups where this is good as well so the Abzan Yorgmoth matchup as well is very important to have you know one mana removal to take out their early ramp like the lighted halfling for example and also to be able to take out your uh, yorgmoth on the spot before it starts to doing a ton of damage as well so fatal push works very nicely in this deck as well because we can trigger a revolt so easily because of all of our sacrifice outlets and then in terms of the mana base uh, 22 lands is, is pretty standard for these sorts of decks you know we do run important three drops so hitting our third land drop is pretty important but we do have deadly dispute which is great at ensuring that we hit our third land we have voldoran epicure that can help us dig towards our third land as well so 22 has felt like kind of the sweet spot here now I'm not running as many uh, utility lands as a lot of the other red black decks do because we do have pretty stringent mana constraints in this deck. We do ideally want to have double black on turn two and double red on turn three for Bloodgast and Season Pyromancer. Now Bloodgast typically a card that you might not want to hard cast on turn two. You often want to discard it to stuff like Epicure or Season Pyromancer, but I feel like it's very important to hard cast on turn two because in a lot of matchups, especially against decks like Is It Wizards, you want to be able to hard cast Bloodgast into Sorin on turn three to use the Lightning Helix mode immediately as an interaction. So I do feel like it's important to have double black on turn two for Bloodgast consistently. And so in order to achieve that, we are having to run four Sulphur Springs and Mount Doom in addition to all of the other typically good uh, black red jewel lands, which is pretty painful, right? We are running a lot of pain lands but we do have a lot of ways to gain life as well right we've got the Sorin and the vein ripper which are both very good at gaining us life back as well so i feel like in order to consistently have double black and double red we do need to be running a lot of dual lands but we do have some room for some utility lands we've got one of each of the creature lands in den of the bugbear and hive the eye tyrant which again just gives us extra reach gives us additional stuff to do with our mana very good against control as well to just give us an extra thing to do without having to commit more creatures to the battlefield then one takanuma and one sokanzan both actually very nice in this deck as well because takanuma can help us assemble both Sorin and Vein Ripper if you want to try and assemble that synergy as well as getting stuff 
back like season pyromancer which is a good when we're empty handed and then sock and Zan, the tokens are also very nice in this deck with goblin bombardment as well so mana base nothing too flashy because we do need to hit double black and double red but it definitely serves its purpose and the, the utility lands here also work very well with our game plan in general so next up we'll have a look at the sideboard starting off here with four copies of thought which is really important for a number of matchups so first of all very important against the control matchup i'll explain my full sideboard plan against control in a second because we do pivot quite a lot against control but very important against control very important against combo decks as well especially combo decks that aren't reliant on creatures so creature based combo decks aren't too difficult for us because we've obviously got fatal push and bombardment which is really good at keeping them off it but against decks like goblin child belt shore and Domitable creativity for example in thought seize is super important because it's the only way we have of slowing them down and they can often race us they're not the most played decks but thought seize is very important to have in those matchups as well and additionally i think it's the best cyborg tool against mono green devotion as well so since devotion started running utopia sprawl i don't feel like cards like fatal push are an efficient way to slow them down really so Thoughtseize definitely feels like the best option in that matchup. I just, you know, taking the top end from their hand to slow them down. They're also a deck that tends to mulligan quite a lot as well, which Thoughtseize obviously punishes there as well. Then we've got three copies of Omnixus, which is another tool against control. Really, really difficult for them to deal with efficiently because, especially if you casualty it, even if they've got a counter spell, they can typically only answer one of these, and then you've just got a Planeswalker on board, which is really difficult for them to deal with. If you get to keep both of these, it just applies constant pressure to them. You know, the main weakness of our main deck against control is against sweepers, especially Divine Purge is good at keeping stuff like Bloodcast um, you know, out of the game because it you know, makes us have to pay four to recast it and then makes it re-enter always tap. So Sweepers, especially stuff like Farewell as well, is a pretty big card against us. So having Omnixus is a card that just completely dodges those and constantly applies pressure to their life total, especially if we can get it casualtyed on turn three, is really, really difficult for Control to ever beat. So while we're on the topic of Control, I might as well tell you about my game plan against Control because we do board in a lot. So against Control, I like boarding in four Thought Seas, three Omnixus, two Pithing Needle because it's obviously very good against both Teferi and the Wandering Emperor. And then I also like bringing in two copies of Unlicensed Hearse against stuff like Snapcaster Mage, Kaleem, and Memory Deluge, as well as sometimes they run stuff like Dig Through Time now. So we bring in all of these cards, and then we cut Fatal Push, and then I also like cutting the Vein Ripper and all but one of the Sorins as well, because Sorin and Vein Ripper is good against control if you can get it down, but it also relies on the Sorin re resolving. We don't have Cavern of Souls in the deck because I don't think we can afford to in the mana base, and so hard casting Vein Ripper is basically never going to happen because they're almost always going to have a, a counter spell up by the time that we can do this as well. So I typically like cutting all of these and then we go super low to the ground. We've got discard spells. Like I said, Omnixus is very difficult for them to deal with. Pithing Needle stops them running away with the game with Teferi unless they have something like a Divine Purge. And then Hearse is really good at keeping them off their synergies like Kaleem, like I said. Snapcaster Mage is a good way for them to start, you know, getting ahead on terms of card advantage. And then Deluge stops them putting ahead as well. And is also just a nice threat as well, right? If we have a Hearse and they don't answer it, any creature off the top allows us to just crew it up and attack as well. So we do pivot quite a lot against control, but post sideboard the matchup has definitely felt favoured to me, mainly off the back of cards like Thought Season Obnixless. Then in terms of extra creature removal, we've got two Shove Aside and two Shieldra's Edict. So Shove Aside is basically just upgraded Strangle and is such a good card against the Is It Wizards matchup. Like I said, um, Goblin Bombardment isn't actually as efficient against Is It Wizards because the killing their creatures in quickly is so important. So my slowball plan against Is It Wizards is I bring in two Shove Aside and two Shieldra's Edict and I trim two Shambling Ghast and I actually trim on two Goblin Bombardment for that reason as well because you really don't want to be drawing this card in multiples in that matchup. Drawing the first copy is nice, especially once you have started to stabilise because once once you do get to having access to more mana, we can then start using Bombardment to pick down their creatures as well, but having efficient removal like Shove Aside is so, so important. And like I said, one mana removal takes out the creature straight away. If you're on the draw, it's essentially like a lightning bolt as well. You can play at instant speed, which is pretty big. And then the reason I'm, I'm choosing to run Shielder's Edict instead of just the full four copies of Shove Aside is predominantly for mirror matches against other Sorin decks. So initially I did just have four Shove Aside and the Wizards matchup felt great because of that, but I did then queue into Rakdos Mid range and the opponent just had Sorin Vein Ripper and there was basically nothing that we could do, right? We're a sacrifice deck which is going to trigger the opponent's passive ability on this as well. So against opposing Sorin Vein Ripper decks, I like bringing Thought Seas to keep them off that synergy and then have Shieldred Edict as a way to, to kill the Vein Ripper as well. And then it's also just more flexible, right? There are other matchups that are going to have big creatures as well. So for example, if you're against a reanimated deck, having this as a way to take out something like a Ceres Emissary or an Attractor as well is pretty big. So I like splitting this 
this up here. Both are good against wizards, but Shield of Edict gives you a way to take out bigger creatures as well. And then next up we've got Pithing Needle, which like I said, I bring against Control, but is also very big against a lot of the creature-based combo decks as well. Stuff like Yorgmoth, you bring in a name Yorgmoth. Against Samwise, you bring this in a name Cauldron Familiar. And then against Kethys, you can bring this in a name Kethys as well. So very nice against Control and the creature-based combo decks as well. And then we've got two copies of Unlicensed Hearse, which like I said, again, I do bring in against Control, but is also very important against the graveyard-based decks. Like, uh, is it Phoenix? I've seen a lot of recently as well. This keeps them off Phoenix, keeps their graveyard trim so they can't cast Treasure Cruise as easily, keeps them off Delirium for stuff like Dragon's Rage Channeler as well. And then obviously there are some other graveyard decks as well, like Reanimator. And I have faced uh, someone playing Dredge recently as well, which was also a very tricky matchup. So having Hearst there is very important. I do feel like graveyard hate is, is important to have right now, especially because of Is It Phoenix. So that's the deck overall, and I'm really happy with how this list came together. I think Soren and Vayne is one of the most powerful things to be doing in the format. And I also feel like Goblin Bombardment Sacrifice was one of the most underrated archetypes as well. And they both work so well together. So being able to combine them gives you a really, really strong proactive game plan, no matter what deck you're against. If you can assemble these two cards together, you can just close the game out super, super quickly. And I also just feel like the deck has really good tools to fight against all of the established top decks right now. I feel like within the 75, you have a really solid game plan for all of the most commonly played decks. The only decks that I typically struggled against in testing were much more fringe decks that just tend to go way over the top of you. Like the Enchantress Phyrexian Unlife Solemnity deck was a bit of a struggle. And I also lost to some decks that were running like the, the Cultless Ramp package with stuff like Mindstone and then tops out with Ugin and Forsaken Monument and stuff like that. But I think it's a good position to be in where you're good against all of the commonly played decks and you're only really struggling against the, the kind of fringe decks that don't really see much play. And those sorts of decks get really punished by the other commonly played decks like is it wizards which is the main reason they don't see much play so i feel like the deck is very strong and also pretty well positioned as well if that makes sense uh, if you have any questions about the deck at all definitely let me know in the comments uh, but next up i've got some gameplay i've just got five matches that i was playing with this on the ladder so you guys can see it in action either way hope you enjoyed the deck hope you enjoyed the video and i'll catch you all in the next one big up okay so we're going second tier And yeah, this sound looks pretty good. Right, we've got Epicure into Deadly Dispute. Uh, we've got, you know, we, we can sacrifice the Blood Token to the Deadly Dispute, which then means that we can sacrifice the Voldaren Epicure to the Sorin as well if we need to use the Helix ability. So Lurus into Hallowed Fountain, either going to be Auras, okay, or they're, they're on the, the Artifact Aggro deck. So really got to hope they don't have an Ornithopter here. If they don't have Ornithopter, we could use the Bombardment next turn to just cleanly kill the Ingenious Smith before it starts growing. Um, if they do have Ornithopter, they are presumably just going to cast it this turn. Make the Smith a 2-2, which puts it out of range. Okay, they do have the Ornithopter, and they find a Retrofit of Foundry. So opponents getting their synergies online pretty nicely over there. So we draw Blood Ghast, which we obviously can't cast this turn. I think we're just going to use the Deadly Dispute, and I think I'm going to do it now as well, because... We don't want it to get hit by a Metallic Rebuke, really, because if we can hit something like a Fatal Push off it, it'll be pretty nice. Oh, wow, we found the Vein Ripper. That's pretty sweet. Now, there is maybe an argument, actually, to holding off on the Deadly Dispute because we probably prefer them using dis uh, using the Metallic Rebuke on the Dispute rather than the the Sorin, for example, but I still like getting off there because if, if we can find a Fatal Push off the Dispute, we can just push the Smith. And just getting the treasure token in general allows us to play around the dispute a little bit more easily anyway, right? Because we can then get to a point where we can pay the tax a little bit more efficiently. Well, they choose to portable hold the treasure token. That does deny us the mana a little bit. And they do represent um, mana here for disputes. So I think I'm going to lead on the Season Pyromancer here because having the, the Sorin get hit by dispute is pretty rough here. So And the, the Season Pyromancer is good in this spot, so if the Season Pyromancer resolves, I think we're in a decent spot. And if it doesn't, I would much rather have the Season Pyromancer be countered than the Sorin, because I feel like Sorin Vein Ripper is going to be really difficult for their deck to beat, especially because their creatures don't typically scale. I mean, obviously this Ingenious Smith could get to a 5-5 five five pretty quickly, but we can chump block that on the ground chump block that on the ground pretty easy. Oh, they do have Shadow Spear, though, which is a bit of a concern. But... I still feel like Vayneriff is going to be very good in this spot. So here, we're going to be taking five trample damage anyway. So we're just going to chump block the, the Ingenious Smith and, and take the damage from the 5-5. The five five. And I think here we just have to jam the Sorin and hope they don't have it. I feel like if they had Rebuke, they would have used it last turn on the Season Pyromancer, most likely. So they would have had to draw it for this turn. Okay, they don't have it. So now we get to get the Vayne Ripper down. And now we've got Fatal Push-Up as well, which is pretty huge. So here we can just go Vayne Ripper. 
I think it's probably greedy to attack. Maybe we can attack with some of the smaller creatures here, but I feel like we're winning the long game regardless. We have the inevitability in this spot. So here, it's very important to hold on to the Fatal Push, because if we push the 5-5 five five now, they can just re-equip the Shadow Spear to the Ingenious Smith. Obviously, this does open up the possibility to them top-decking Metallic Rebuke this turn, but I still think it's worth holding on and waiting for it so they don't have the opportunity to re-equip the Shadow Spear. I'm going to Fatal Push pre-combat, because if they do have the Rebuke, it does change how I block here, most likely. But we get to drain them for two anyway. Start getting life back. Now we can just chump block the Ingenious Smith here. Drain them for an additional two off the Vein Ripper. And with Goblin Bombardment in hand, I think we just have lethal this following turn, even though the opponent's at 20 life here, right? They could obviously have a way to block the Vein Ripper if they cast like an Ornithopter here or something like that, but if they don't, I mean, even with that, I think we still have a, a decent shot of being able to go for lethal here, so. Let me just calculate. So I, we're definitely going to attack first here, obviously. I'm just trying to think whether we should. Plus the Sorin to give the Vayner for life link, or just use the Vayner, use the, the Helix ability. I think we're just going to use the Helix ability here, because there's nothing that can fizzle what we're trying to do here, I don't think. You know, we've got enough mana here to be able to play around Metallic Rebuke if that's what they do have. So, puts them down to 9, then we sacrifice the Blood Ghast to... This basically deals 5 damage, puts them down to 4, and then... We just play the, the Sulphur Springs, and then we can play Goblin Bombardment. And even if they have the, the Metallic Rebuke, we, we can still resolve the, the Bombardment here. And now each of our creatures represents 3 damage, so we have way over lethal here, even though the opponent was at 20. So get to take down game 1 there. This has felt like a pretty good matchup so far in testing. Uh, in terms of sideboarding... I think I like Pithing Needle here because that is a way they can grind against us. If we can't get Vein Ripper down, then them getting, you know, multiple foundries down is a really good way for them to go over the top. Typically, if I'm looking for trims, you know, uh, uh, Shambling Gas is a fairly free thing to trim. Now, obviously, Shambling Gas does enable some pretty fast starts for us. Like, for example, if we go Shambling Gas into Deadly Dispute, then we get two treasures to enable us to hard cast Vein Ripper on turn four, which is pretty good generically. But when we're trying to find cuts to bring cyborg cards in, it does feel like the the least central card to our game plan, if that makes sense. I think Epicure is really important as a vampire and a way to, to loot uh, Bloodgast into the graveyard. I feel like Unlucky Witness is just by far and away the best sacrifice fodder. Bloodgast obviously works super well with both of our game plans, and then everything else is pretty central. Obviously, there'll be some matchups where we cut Fatal Push, but this is definitely not one of them. So this hand looks pretty good to me. Just trying to think what, in terms of cuts. I, I do want to keep the Fatal Push. <sighs> Bloodgast... I mean, it is very nice with Sorin, but I feel like it's probably the least important card in our current hand, if that makes sense. I could have also maybe seen an argument to... to actually, no, I was going to say I've seen an argument to putting back the Sorin here, but Sorin, you know, we have the Epicure here already, and then if we can find the Vein Ripper, it's a really important card as well. Obviously, drawing Season Pyromancer off the top, if I knew that was going to be the top card, I think I probably would have put back Sorin instead, because... Or maybe... Maybe Deadly Dispute, because obviously you do want to have the... Um, you do want to have the uh, the Blood Ghast when you've got Season Pyromancer because it's just the best card to discard off it. So here I just want to use the Fatal Push on the, the Esper Sentinel without giving them an extra card. They cast another Sentinel, so they kind of force us to use it now, um, which I think is fine. I mean, it's, it's a little bit awkward because we then have to play around this second Sentinel when we're thinking about casting Deadly Dispute or, or Sorin, but we could just go for the Season Pyromancer next turn instead, potentially. Or now we could just go for, for Deadly Dispute as well. I think I like just jamming the Season Pyromancer here, though. If they have Metallic Rebuke, then it's not the worst thing in the world. If they do have Metallic Rebuke, then we still have a pretty solid follow-up the next turn, right? We can, if we draw a land, we can potentially go Sorin, sack the Epicure. If not, we can go Deadly Dispute and pay for the, the Sentinel tax. So even though Pyromancer did get countered there, it's not the worst thing in the well, I don't think. So opponent cast another Citadel. Ha, and Soul Artifact is kind of tricky here. I think we'll we'll let the damage through this time because... Oh, wow. Okay, we drew Vein Ripper. So now I think we just got to jam the Sorin, right? If they don't have mana up here for the, for the Metallic Rebuke, so now we can just get the Vein Ripper down, which is pretty big in this spot, right? Because that is a potential way that we can just you know, mitigate the, the damage we're taking off the Citadel because of the Drain ability on the Vein Ripper here. Um, we can obviously use the, the Sorin ability to sacrifice the Epicure to kill the Esper Sentinel, but I assume they're probably going to prioritize attacking down the Sorin here. Ah, uh, they do have Glass Casket as well, so that takes out both our blocker and our fuel for the Sorin as well. There's no way that we're going to be blocking the with the Vein Ripper here, right? Unfortunately, we just got to lose the, the Sorin, which kind of sucks because we could use the Sorin to turn the Vein Ripper into a 7-6, which would then mean that we can just block the Citadel all day and not have to worry about it. So losing the Sorin there does kind of suck. So that was a good sequence for the opponent there. Oh, okay. Drawing the Fatal Push is huge here because 
Hushbringer does shut off the 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 uh, the passive ability on Vein Ripper, so I think we just got to push the Hushbringer here. Definitely want to do it now this turn while we've already paid for the Sentinel tax, and then we're going to ship it back. We could obviously attack with the Vein Ripper, but we're already at. 12 and that would allow them to freely attack with the Esper Sentinel which would be 6 damage puts us on an immediate 2 turn clock which I don't think is a great idea ha ah, they have another Hushbringer which is pretty awkward because now that shuts off the ETB of the, the Season Pyromancer so here we could obviously use the Deadly Disputes and but, but I really don't want to be giving the opponent any extra cards here right this is a super low resource stalemate and so we would only have access to 3 mana off the Deadly Dispute and if we whiff then that's really bad when we're staring down this attack from the Dark Steel Citadel every single turn. So here, I think I'm just going to ship it back. They can't really attack with anything other than the Citadel, so I'm just going to use the Season Pyromancer from the Graveyard, get two Jump Blockers in play, Jump Block the Citadel, and now next turn, we have a Jump Blocker in play for the Citadel. We we can more, you know, freely just go for the Deadly Dispute here. Again, the Hushbringer is going to shut off the Drain ability on the Vein Ripper, so we still need to be very wary of this damage that we're taking from the Citadel every single turn. Ha, okay, Bombardment is an interesting draw here. So I'm going to Bombardment here, pay for the Esper Sentinel, and then I think it's just best to probably jam the Season Pyromancer here. Obviously, that does make Metallic Rebuke live, but if that's the last card in their hand, then fair beats. If not, then we get to kill the Hushbringer here and defend against the Dark Steel Citadel, which is pretty big. Okay, it looks like they, they've got priority, but that could just be the Retrofit Foundry. Okay, sweet. That's pretty big. So we get the Season Pyromancer in play. Obviously, we don't get the ability off it, which is a little bit annoying, but here we can just, you know, chump block the Citadel and then kill the Hushbringer with two pings off the Bombardment, which is pretty nice, right? We get the Hushbringer off the battlefield. Then Vein Ripper becomes live again. Then we've got the Season Pyromancer in the Graveyard, which gives us two additional tokens, which we can then use as chump blockers as we need, if we need. They do have the Luris in hand, though, which they could obviously use to get the Hushbringer back, which is something we need to be wary of. And also the other awkward thing here is that if we do sacrifice both creatures to the Bombardment, we don't have a good target for the Deadly Dispute then, but... I feel like having two creatures in play is pretty big here because Hushbringer is shutting off our way of closing the game out from this spot, right? We don't really have a good way with how we sideboarded to remove the Dark Steel Citadel from the battlefield. So I think the main way that we win this is just off the Vein Ripper passive. So for that to work, we obviously need to take the Hushbringer out here, really. And I guess the other thing is with the Season Pyromancer that makes this quite easy is we can go... Vein, uh, sorry, Bombardment, take out the Hushbringer. Then if they do cast Luris, we can then use Season Pyromancer to make two more tokens and then use the Bombardment to take out the, the Luris. Ha, another in Soul Artifact. Okay, that's a bit of a problem. So they attack with both Citadels. Wow, okay, I'd love for them to attack with the Hushbringer. I mean, I guess the uh, the Thopter is a free attack for them because they can just turn it into a 4-4 if we do. But with the Vein Ripper, which we'll definitely be doing here. So here we're obviously going to make the blocks against the Dark Steel Citadel to survive. And then we can use the Bombardment to take out the Hushbringer. Now, next turn, they do have enough mana to be able to cast Luris and recast the Hushbringer. But they have to take a turn off from attacking with both of the Citadels if they do that. So that's... I mean, it would be a little bit annoying, but it wouldn't be the end of the world, really, I don't think. Wow, okay, another Vein Ripper, interesting. I mean, we obviously don't have enough mana for that, and we don't have enough stuff in play to use with the Season Pyromancer. So here, there is kind of a catch-22, like I said, but I feel like we're in a decent spot, because if they do go Lurus into Hushbringer, we can take out the Lurus with the Season Pyromancer tokens... Uh, but we we also get to keep both tokens going into our turn, which gives us, a, you know, we can untap with Deadly Dispute as well, which is pretty big. So it does look like they're going to be recasting the Hushbringer here, which is a little bit annoying. But it does, like I said, keeps the pressure off. We don't have to uh, block. Sorry, I'm just, just trying to think whether I want to do Season Pyromancer now. I don't think it really makes a difference. I mean, we could go Season Pyromancer now, and we get both Vein Ripper triggers if we take out the Lurus. The risk here is that... If we don't draw anything great, we don't have a f good follow-up play. But I feel like if we draw a land, we can cast the Vein Ripper. If we don't draw a land, then we're likely drawing a creature which we can use with the Deadly Dispute anyway. So I feel like it's working for the Season Pyromancer now. The counterplay is we could just wait until our turn. Then we lose the Vein Ripper triggers, but we have a live target for the Deadly Dispute. 
Ha, huh, okay. Unlucky witness. I mean, it's usually great with deadly dispute, but here we don't get the death trigger at all because of the hush bringer. So we could deadly dispute now, but it's pretty risky, right? If we whiff off the deadly dispute, then we're under a lot of pressure. So I think we've just got to pass back, chump block with the witness, and then use deadly dispute. The other thing is that does now make metallic rebuke live, so I didn't really think about that when passing the turn, so that's a potential problem, actually. I think if I'd taken a little bit longer to think about it, I probably should have used deadly dispute during my turn because rebuke is now live, and they don't necessarily need to have drawn it this turn as well. They were completely tapped out there, so having rebuke here would be pretty rough. Because, you know, we are pretty likely to draw cheap creatures that we could have played if we used the Dispute during our turn. And it looks like they might have it here. So that was a, probably a misplay on my part. I should have main phased the Dispute. You know, obviously, again, we're under pressure if we do whiff. But because we got the Vein Ripper triggers last turn, we're not just dead to attack. Yeah, they do have the Rebuke. So that was a misplay on my part. I should have definitely used the Dispute during my turn. And then we could have potentially drawn a couple cheap creatures which we could use to block. So... Now we're in a bit of a, a, a rough position. Um, ha, deadly dispute, yeah. So I might have just punted this game. Unfortunate. Uh, yeah, because I do feel like we've got pretty good chances of drawing right. If we'd drawn this dispute off the deadly dispute, we can use the dispute to sacrifice the treasure token. You know, we would have had good dispute fodder. So here, I feel like we've just got to rely on the opponent making a mistake. I basically want to bait them into blocking with the Hushbringer here, right? Okay, they don't block with the Hushbringer, so we're probably dead then. If we, if they block with the Hushbringer there, then we can dispute, start gaining back off the 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 passive here. I don't think we can afford to pay the Sentinel tax. And then, yeah, we're just dead here, unfortunately. So, yeah, I think I did punt by not casting the Deadly Dispute main phase. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, yeah, I, on reflection, that definitely was a mistake because... You know, the only risk of not doing it main phase... Yeah, we just just scoop it up and go game through here. But the, the, the main risk of not doing it main phase there is that we whip. You know, if we whiff off the dispute, we don't have Unlucky Witness as a chump block for one of their, their citadels. But opening us up to a potential metallic rebuke when they were, you know, when they were tapped out that time, we could have done it cleanly. Yeah, that was definitely a mistake on my part. But I feel like with a bombardment in play and a, a second uh, Vayner Primit in hand we probably would have been able to win that game, even with two in soul artifacts in play, because we can, you know, if, as long as we draw some creatures off that dispute, we can then use the bombardments to ping down the Hushbringer, get the second Vein Ripper down, and then just start chump blocking with a bunch of creatures and draining the opponent out at the same time. Uh, so yeah, unfortunate, but actually thinking about it, I maybe should have brought in the, the Shielded's Edict as well. Uh, or instead of the Pithing Needle, potentially, because of the in soul artifacts. So maybe I made a mistake in sideboarding. So this hand, I feel like is we're keeping it off the back of the Season Pyromancer, but now that we've got Sorin Vein Ripper, and we, this hand just lines up perfectly, right? We've got the Fatal Push for the Hushbringer. Now we can go Sorin while they don't have Metallic Rebuke up. Minus three, get the Vein Ripper down. And the next time we can go Pithing Needle into Season Pyromancer, and even if they've gotten Soul Artifacts, we're basically guaranteed to get the Sorin Plus off here, unless they have Pithing Needle or, like, you know, Get Lost or something, or, like, a, you know, Fateful Absence or something, so... You know, Vein Ripper is much, much more effective on this sort of board state than when we're getting attacked down by the Insole Artifacts every single turn. And additionally, like I said, getting off the plus one ability off Sorin is so, so big here because it basically just means that we can just block the Insole Artifacts every single turn, which is pretty huge. So, yeah, I feel very, very confident in this game. Obviously, being on the plays made quite a big difference as well. But yeah, we'll see what the opponent's got here. If they do have, or they don't have, um, I was going to say they don't have a, a, a Dark Seal Citadel in play. If they had a Dark Seal Citadel in play, then they could have done the same line they did last turn where they insult and then attack down the Sorin immediately, and we we're basically forced to just let that through. So here we could obviously go for the Season Pyromancer, but it's getting shut off by, this, by the Hushbringer. So here I'm just going to go for Pithing Needle and just name Retrofit a Foundry. Um, because I feel like it's, it's very important to get that down now before they have the opportunity to start making 4-4s, four right? Because this, if this season Pyromancer was live and was drawing us two, then I could maybe see the argument for going for that, but it's not really doing anything on the current board state, and I think it's more important to preemptively get this needle down in case, because I, I think there's a very good chance they would 
you know, if they had hush bringers, play them out as a priority. And if they have retrofit a foundry on the top, to have that in their hand as a follow up play, if that makes sense, which, you know, it would, would apply pressure against us. Hi, okay, they do have Mashiko's Reign of Truth, which can take out the Sorin here, but thankfully they don't have many artifacts and enchantments in play. So I feel like we're still on the front foot at this point. Ha, we do draw a Goblin Bombardment, but unfortunately we can't take out the Hushbringer. So I think I just like firing up Den of the Bugbear here because not only does that help us race, which is pretty important, but it also gets another creature in play so that we can potentially, if we do want to take out this Hushbringer, next turn we could go Bombardment into Pyromancer, sack two of our creatures and just take out the Hushbringer, which could obviously be relevant. Ah, they do have an answer for the Vein Ripper here, and they deny us the, the, the passive ability, so they take out the Vein Ripper. Now things get a little bit more dicey. I did feel pretty far ahead. I mean, opponent's still at three, but they do get to attack him with the Hushbringer, puts them back up to six again. Uh, but we can take out the Hushbringer, which is a pretty big deal. And they don't have access to Metallic Rebuke here either. So whatever we cast next turn is basically guaranteed to resolve... Okay, they just ship it back. I mean, again, I'm just going to fire up the den and attack, right? They're not going to get the Machiko's buff again. This puts them down to one, which first of all means they can't activate Spire or a Darker Waste for Colored Mana if they don't attack with the Hushbringer. Uh, it means they need to keep four creatures back to block the den of the Bugbear, and also means that they're just dead to Goblin Bombardment, right? Even if they attack with Hushbringer, puts them back up to two. We can just cast Bombardment and sack both of our Goblin Tokens here, which is, you know, another reason why I was very keen to attack with the Dead of the Bugbears, because it gives us more fodder to sacrifice to the Bombardment here. So, I feel like we're we're winning in so many different ways here, right? I'd be very surprised. The, the only other thing I'm worried about here is if they go, you know, Artifact, Artifact, Machiko's Reign of Truth to buff the Hushbringer again. Ha, okay, Glass Casket, that, that is an issue, because that not only... Uh, shuts us off an extra target to use with the bombardment, but it also gives them another. Uh, it also takes out another attacker, so they have to hold less back to be able to win. Well, I mean, we still win here, right? That was a pretty good turn. Shuts off, you know, shuts off Den of the Bugbear as a wing con because they go up to two, but we can just go bombardment into season pyromancer, ping them with two of our creatures here. So, even though that was a pretty good turn from the opponent, we still managed to get there, right? We have a lot of different ways to close games out, and this is why, you know, bombardment the reach it gives is is so nice, even against aggro decks. Okay, so we're going first here. And yeah, this sound looks good, right? We've got Epicure on turn one into probably Deadly Dispute on turn two, but we've got the option to Bombardment if the opponent does play a one toughness creature. And then we've got Season Pyromancer to fix our hand. We've got Bombardment to get online as well. And then, you know, Deadly Dispute into Vein Ripper is also, you know, a very real way to hardcast it if the game does go long as well. So pretty happy with this hand for sure. Okay, so I think I'm just going to pass back and then. Probably just go for Deadly Dispute during the opponent's turn. I don't think, you know, we're not running Thought Seize, so there's nothing we can really find for one mana that's crucial to find here. Um, and also, if the opponent tried to use a removal spell on the Epicure, being able to dispute that in response would be pretty nice. Okay, interesting. So I definitely think I want to keep one of these Vein Riffers around. So I think I'm going to lead on attacking first, and then probably just go Season Pyromancer, and then discard one Bombardment, one Vein Riffer, I think. You know, definitely want to keep one Vayner because we're only one land away from being able to hardcast it in a couple of turns. And obviously, the first copy of Bombardment has a ton of value as well, especially when we already have four creatures in play. Okay. Favor of the Mirror Breaker. So, almost definitely going to be against just Rakdos Midrange here, I think. Um, so, we can play Bloodgast and then, you know, play Bombardment and then play land, but I definitely, you know, there's no way we should just burn this treasure token here without any good reason. I'm going to attack with everything before we play the Bombardment, because I think there's more of a chance they might block. I guess it doesn't really make a difference here, because I imagine we're going to be killing the, um, killing this uh, Tutu token anyway, because we really want to deny them the mana. There's there's still a reasonable chance they could be on Sorin and Vayner for themselves, and so I want to deny them the treasures so they can't ramp into the the Vein Ripper if they do have that, for example. And like I said, you know, we could have obviously gone um, Bloodgast, Bombardment, 
use the bombardment to c- to deal one damage, then play land to bring black the black the blood blood gas. But we'd have to sacrifice the treasure in order to do that, and the treasure is really important, at enabling us to cast Vein Ripper this turn. And I think we should just win, right? Unless the opponent happens to have Sorin into Vein Ripper themselves, we should just be able to win by going Vein Ripper and then just sacrifice our board with the bombardment because it each creature represents three damage. We've obviously got our attack steps as well, and with you know with four creatures in play. That's obviously 12 damage in and of itself, including any any attacks that we get through with as well. So just a favor from the opponent. I think we should just be good here, right? There's nothing they can really do to stop us from just killing them. We obviously get the blood gas back here as well. And so, yeah, we should have more than enough for lethal. So we'll just attack and then just sack everything, go face with all the damage. We could even sacrifice to ping the... The 2-2 two, two down, I think that would be more than enough to win. Because we can obviously also sacrifice the Vein Ripper as the last creature, which deals an extra 3 point of damage here as well. So, But we, we don't even need to attack here, right? We can just sack, sack our board, ping the opponent down. And yeah, obviously opponent had a slower start there, but these are the kind of starts that Vayner plus Bombardment can just completely close the game out on really quickly. So here we're against the mid-range deck. I'm not 100% sure if they're on Sorin, uh, Vayner for There's still a chance they're just on, you know, kind of old school, regular red, bl red black mid range. So I'm going to bring in the Shielders Edict as a hedge, right? If they are on Sorin, Vayner Ripper, it's nice to have Edict as a way to potentially take out their Sorin pretty cleanly. Um, but I don't want to board in Thoughtseize if they're just on regular Rakdos mid range because these sorts of. We are kind of a mid-range deck ourselves. These kind of mid-range mirrors often just come down to top decks, especially if the opponent keeps their discard spells in. And the deck with the discard spells in is going to have more dead top decks when the game enters that state. So I think against regular red black mid-range, I don't like Thoughtseize, but if it turns out the opponent is on Sorin Vein Ripper, I do like bringing Thoughtseize because our deck can struggle to beat Vein Ripper if we don't have the Shielders Edict to answer it immediately because not only... Are we sacrificing as part of our game plan, which their Vein Ripper punishes, but we can't very cleanly take it out with stuff like Bombardment because each individual ping has to, you know, will trigger the ward, making us sacrifice another creature. So, but yeah, like I said, I don't want to overslide Bob, but we're not 100% sure what we're up against. So, have to mulligan that one for sure. You can't keep one land, especially when the one land is a pathway. This we can keep, though. I think Unlucky Witness and Bombardment is really good at helping us dig towards stuff. Unfortunately, if we hit a uh, Vein Ripper off the Unlucky Witness, we can't put it into play off the Sorin because it's not in our hand, but I still think this is a perfectly good keep for sure. Getting a Bombardment in play is going to be good against them regardless, and then we can also, um, you know, it's also just good at killing their creatures and just triggering our, our sacrifice abilities like the Unlucky Witness as well. And obviously gives us great reach as the game goes on. So into here, I... I'm kind of suspecting they might be on... Okay, yeah, seeing Bloodgast almost assuredly going to be on Sorin Vein Ripper then. So if this does go to a game three, I think I'm going to be bringing in um, Thoughtseize. So since they gave the Inzi Trample, there's no point in really blocking with the Unlucky Witness because we don't get uh, a, a good chump there, really. Oh, wow. Okay. And I was going to say, just in case they cast something, I would rather wait until main phase two. So now they cast a Crucius, we can just pick that off with the Unlucky Witness and get the, uh, the XL2 here. Okay, we hit a Bombardment and a land, so not ideal. Like, the second Bombardment has virtually no use in this matchup because Red Black, unless they're running Feed the Swarm, which I very much doubt, is going to be pretty much dead. Now it's kind of an awkward spot here where I really want to play the land, but if I play this Takanuma, I can only cast Sorin or Epicure, and casting Sorin on this board state does literally nothing. It just dies to their creatures, so my two options here are just... I could go Bombardment to get a second one in play, but like I said, that basically does nothing. I could just ignore the two exiled cards and go double Epicure here, but I think I'm just going to go single Epicure. We can still use the Blood Token to loot. Oh, wow, we found Vein Ripper. Okay, that's absolutely huge. So now the next turn we can go Sorin Vein Ripper, which is massive. Um, you know, especially on this board state where we've already got a Bombardment in play, and we've got, you know, a couple of Epicures. If the Sorin survives, we can start sacrificing the Epicures to, you know, ping off their creatures. Um, we can obviously also use the Sorin to make the Vein Ripper a 7-6. Okay, yeah, so definitely, opponent's definitely on Sorin Vein Ripper. Um, I'm not sure how much I'll have Inti in their deck. I mean, I guess it does discard Bloodgast, and it is nice with Crucius as well. So that is actually not bad. I've not tried this. I've not tried the Crucius Inti builds out that much myself. 
So they do hit Pithy Needle, but with the current knowledge they've got, I assume they're just going to Pithy Needle the Bombardment here. If they, if they, and also, you know, they're also running Sorin themselves, so it would be very weird for them to name Sorin off this Pithy Needle. Wasn't sure whether to block with the Voldar and Epicure there, because if they have another land, they can just immediately bring it back, but... Here, I think, you know, we definitely want to get the, the, the Vayne Ripper down here for sure. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay. This is an absolute punt on my part. If they have Shildred's Edict, I'm going to feel like such an idiot here. I obviously should have cast the Epicure first. This, okay. Gotta pray we don't get punished for this, because this, this was an absolute punt on my part if we did. Okay. So that was just a huge mistake. I should have obviously gone Epicure first before the Sorin. Um, and then that plays around Shielder's Edict. That was, and that is a card they could very reasonably be running. So that was just a huge mistake on my part. Obviously, we didn't get punished, thankfully. But yeah, that was that was really stupid of me. So here, <coughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they, uh, oh, they do have a removal spell for the Vayne Ripper, but it wasn't a Shielder's Edict. So we can't obviously. You know, had the Pithing Needle not been in play, we could have used the Bombardment to sack the Epicure to kill the Bloodgast and force them to sack the Inti instead. Um, well, they don't attack the Sorin. I mean, I'm pretty happy to see that, I think. And the, the Drain 2 off the... Okay, they don't activate the Inti, so their last card in hand must be something they want to keep, obviously. Okay, Push is a nice draw here. Now we can take out the Inti... And we also have access to the Sokanzan here as well, but I think I'm just going to ship it back. And I think I'm going to wait for them to attack, because if they... I think there's a good chance they just discard something from their hand to buff the Inti, because if they buff it to a 5-5 five five and then a 6-6, six six, that puts us on a 2-turn clock rather than a 3-turn clock. So I think there's a chance they might discard something that they might want to use otherwise just to increase their clock. I think there's also a very good argument to pushing the Inti before the attack trigger, but I may maybe I'm maybe I'm just too lost in the source with that decision potentially, but I feel like, you know, we are at eleven. They might want to discard something, you know, say they had two good cards in hand, they might just want to discard one to put us on an immediate two turn clock, force us to block there. Maybe maybe that maybe I'm just thinking too much about it though. There's a chance I should have just pushed pre combat there, but so they play Fable, and we obviously still have the Sorin ability here, even though they've got the Bombardment unlocked. So I think I'm just going to use the Sorin here to sacrifice the Epicure, take out the 2-2, because, you know, they are empty-handed, so the treasure isn't going to matter as much, I don't think, right now. But, you know, if they top-deck Vayne Ripper, that's a way they can turn that on. Um, and, you know, they've obviously got the Den of the Bugbear, so it could en enable them to cast another spell and fire up Den as the game goes on as well. Okay, they do have Liliana here, and they do minus on the Epicure, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, that could represent another fuel for the Sorin uh, Lightning Helix mode. So even though the opponent's at six, and so Hive represents a two-turn clock, I still think I'm going to attack down the Liliana here, mainly because they've got the Fable flipping this turn, and so any creature, or they, they can defend the, the Hive just using Reflection plus Den of the Bugbear, even if they don't draw another creature. And I also want to keep this Deadly Dispute, especially when we have this Blood Token around. So even though Hive is kind of the greedy line because you can take them out in two turns, they can already defend uh, against it because they have Reflection plus Den. So I think taking out the Liliana makes a lot of sense. Okay, another Needle off the top. So I, they could name Sorin here, but I I wouldn't be surprised if they name Hive. I think it's risky for them to name Sorin because Sorin off the top for them is very good right now when they have the Bloodgast in play. Yeah, okay, they name Hive the Eye Tyrant. I think that's the that's a good call from the opponent. Thankfully, they don't have enough mana here to also fire up the Den. And we do have Deadly Dispute, which is a very nice card here. You know, if we chose to just go face there, not only would Liliana discard our Deadly Dispute in this position, but we would also not be able to attack with the, this, the Hive the following turn, so... Ha, huh, okay, Bloodcast is a nice draw, especially when they're below 10 life because this has haste. So thinking about sequencing here, I think it's probably correct to lead on the Deadly Dispute first just to see what we draw, because I think we're, you know, we're not going to sacrifice the Bloodcast to the Deadly Dispute. I don't imagine, right? 
Actually, having said that, we could have... Maybe that was a missed sequence because we could have used the blood token to put the blood ghost in the graveyard, cast the land, attack with the blood ghost, and then deadly dispute off that. And then we see a card deeper. I mean, thankfully, we drew Epicure off the top. Maybe that was a misplay. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this one to make a, a better decision about whether that was right or not. I think with the information we had, it probably was correct to loot the blood ghost first. But I'm not 100% sure. Either way... This worked out fine. We get to attack with the Bloodgast here. Puts them down to three. Then we can sacrifice... I think we just sacrifice the treasure token here. I, I, I value the Bloodgast on the battlefield when they're at three. Wow, okay. That's a nice draw. So now we're just going to be hard, hard casting Vayne Ripper next turn. I think that should be good. Right, we're at 15, so we don't have to worry about them uh, with the den, really. They also don't have enough mana themselves to cast Vayne Ripper if they do draw it. So I feel like we should be in a great spot here. Wow, they fire up the den. Okay, maybe they just figure that they're dead, right? Even though they don't know what we've drawn here. I mean, they're dead to, to the Vein Ripper regardless, right? But yeah, I, I feel like the opponent could have played more defensively there. They wouldn't just be dead on board. But I think, you know, with an average draw off that deadly dispute, we're probably going to be winning from that spot anyway. But yeah, we got there. Nice. Oh, we're against Nora. Shouts out to Nora. Really great deck builder and player. Be interested to see what they're playing. Okay, so we're on the draw here. And yeah, this sound looks pretty good. We have quite a few lands here, but Unlucky Witness into Deadly Dispute is great, especially because with a Sorin in hand, you know, we can potentially draw um, Heart Gate Epicure. I'm actually going to lead on because they've shocked in Steam Vents here. The risk going Unlucky Witness instead of Epicure is that if they choose to kill the witness here we don't get any value off it right we just get the the exile two cards just disappear at the end step so i like leading on epicure just in case they kill it ha, okay so they got ledger shredder here so probably going to be against phoenix i'd imagine so i'm going to lead on deadly dispute here uh would love to find a fatal push okay sick we do find a fatal push so we could go for it now, but then that gives them... That does play around Spell Pierce, but it does give them an, a, you know, a free loot off the Ledger Shredder. So I think I'm going to do it during the upkeep. We only really get punished by Spell Pierce, which Phoenix doesn't tend to run in super high numbers. Some some don't even run it in the main deck. Okay, yeah, we got away with it. So I do think on average, it's probably slightly better EV to do it, to do it there. So happy that we did. And now going into turn three, I mean, the awkward thing about using the Deadly Dispute on the Epicure there rather than the Unlucky Witness is that... We don't have a good way to trigger the unluck un Unlucky Witness Death Trigger anymore, but... And we obviously, you know, it's not ideal that we drew a bunch of lands here, really, but... I still think we're in an okay position. We've got a lot of good draws off the top here, so... I'm going to jam the Sorin here. They could have Spell Pierce up. Oh, yikes, they do have the Spell Pierce, but... I don't know. I feel like you can't always just play scared of it, and it's not the end of the world if that Sorin does get countered, because it's not like we had a Vein Ripper in hand... And they could have also, you know, they represent a lot of different cards by holding open the blue mana there. It could be an end of turn opt, could be an end of turn consider, so... Obviously a little bit annoying, but again, I don't think Phoenix tends to run Spell Pierce in too high numbers, and it wasn't the end of the world it getting countered there, so... I'm just going to run out Bloodgast and Unlucky Witness. Thankfully, they've had a pretty slow start here, you know. If they'd, if they'd had, uh, you know, a fast start with multiple Phoenixes to back up that Spell Pierce there, then I'd be a little bit more worried, but here, I'm, you know, I, as long as they don't have a crazy turn this turn, I think we're still in a decent spot, right? We're still at 19. They're down to 13 now as well. We've, we've got this Hive of the Eye Tyrant as well, so if they don't get the Phoenixes back or we find a way to kill them, we can potentially you know, get them out of the graveyard, which would be pretty sweet. And then, you know, at 13, as they get towards 10, we can start bringing back Bloodgast with haste to apply pressure as well. So thankfully, we're still in a, a reasonable spot, even though we had a pretty slow start, just because they also had a, a pretty slow start themselves. So attacking with the Phoenix, which I'm actually pretty happy to see here. So we could obviously go Bloodgast into Unlucky Witness, but I think I like attacking with the Hive here because there's not really any removal spells that Phoenix commonly run that can... Uh, kill the hive here, right? They could be on Shiver side potentially, but I've not really seen that in many Phoenix lists, to be honest. Um, we do lose out on the Unlucky Witness ability, but this puts them down to seven, which then makes the Blood Ghast in our hand have haste. It also gets rid of the Faithless looting from their graveyard, which shuts off more potential options. Cuts the card out of the graveyard, which, you know, makes it slightly harder for them to set up treasure crews. So, but I'm, I'm mainly like attacking with Hive there because it puts them down to seven, which means that Blood Ghast can just haste out of nowhere, which is pretty sweet. 
So again, we're still at 14, so I'm not too concerned about them bringing back multiple Phoenixes. And it is getting to the point now where they might have to start keeping Phoenixes back to block, which is exactly the sort of spot we want to get ourselves into, really. Okay, they do. They cast another Phoenix, and yeah, they keep one back to block, which kind of makes sense. Oh, we find a Sorin off the top. Okay, that's pretty big. So they're going to cast the Sorin here, and then uh, sack the Bloodgast here, take out the Phoenix, which then enables us to attack with the Epicure. Then we can play the Blood Crypt, which gets back the other Bloodgast from the graveyard. And then we can just cast this other Blood Ghast, which will have haste. Thinking about it, actually, that was probably a mistake to shock in the, the Blood Crypt here, because that puts me down to 12. So if they can get another uh, Phoenix in the graveyard this turn, we're dead to a third Phoenix. So playing the Unlucky Witness was a mistake. Okay, thankfully they didn't have it, but that was definitely a punt on my part. I should have just played the Blood Crypt tapped, and then that shuts off the third Phoenix as an out there. But thankfully we didn't get punished for it. So here, this is obviously a matchup where we want the Unlicensed Hearse. Um... And then I think I'm going to bring in Shove Aside on the draw as an extra way to just immediately kill DRC and Ledger Shredder. And then going to cut the Shambling Ghast as well. And then I think I'm just going to trim around the edges. Bombardment is good in this matchup, but I don't know if we need the full four copies, right? It can be clunky to draw in multiples when you don't have a way to loot it away. And the Is It decks obviously don't have any way to answer enchantments. Um, I'm just trying to think if we really need the second Shove Aside. Because we do have ways to take out their small creatures. Even if the RC gets Delirium, Bombardment can take it out. There's a chance that maybe the second Shove Aside is more valuable than the, the fourth Deadly Dispute. But I do like Deadly Dispute in this matchup because it helps assemble Sora and Vayne Ripper more consistently. And helps to hardcast the Vayne Ripper, which they don't really have good counterplay for. So this hand's pretty awkward. I don't think we can really afford to keep this one on the draw. Maybe on the play I could see an argument for it, but not on the draw. Okay, this hand is better. Definitely keepable. Going to put back one of the Blood Ghasts here. So we've got Fatal Push on turn one, into Hearse on turn two, and then if we can draw an untapped red source, we can then go Pyromancer, discard Bloodgast on uh, on three, which is really nice. Okay, so we did draw the second red source, so that means that we can afford to play this pathway on black. Going to push this Ledger Shred straight away, and then getting Hearse down on turn two against Phoenix is, is so nice as insurance, because it means we don't have to worry about them having a crazy turn three, right? Um, because we, you know, we, we have their graveyard unlocked. Unless they happen to put three phoenixes in the graveyard here, then we should be good. And even then, we get to exile two of them, which really limits the what what they can do here. But yeah, we'll see what they've got. So we're definitely going to be exiling, or almost certainly going to be exiling a phoenix and looting if they don't play that. Or, you know, if they put two phoenixes in the bin, we'll obviously exile both of those. And then next time we've got a pretty sweet turn as well. We can just play Pyromancer, and I'm pretty happy to discard both Bloodgast and Voldar and Epicure here. Okay, they do have Shredder, which is a bit of a concern, because that is one way that they can win through Unlicensed Hearse, right? Shredder is just a threat that's going to grow as the game goes on. So that is a little bit worrying, but... You know, it's only a 2-4 at the moment, so not too much of a concern yet. There's also maybe an argument, too, that I should be bringing in Shieldred's Edict over the... Um, okay, Sorin's a nice draw here, but yeah, there's there's a decent argument that I should be bringing Shieldred's Edict over Shove Aside because it can answer Legislator as well as other threats that they could bring in, like Crackling Drake, but... I like Shove Aside as just more efficient way to, to answer their stuff. Because obviously the difference is that Shredder grows out of range of Shove Aside pretty quickly. But the other issue is that I'm also running quite a lot of two drops, right? We're cutting Shambling Ghast, so you are making the curve a little bit clunkier by doing that. But I think it's pretty close. I don't really think there's too much of a difference. Okay, so they've got Iteration into Sleight of Hand. Very happy not to see a second Shredder. You know, the main thing I would be worried about in this spot is them getting down multiple shredders and just being able to attack in the air past the hearse. Wow, but they don't attack and they don't find the land either, which is obviously great for us. So I think exiling from the graveyard, we just want to keep them off delirium at this point. So <coughs> I'm going to take out the creatures here uh, as a priority because that's the, the land, the, sorry, the card type they have fewest of currently. So here... Hmm. I mean, we can obviously bring back the Bloodgast with Sorin, so I'm going to attack with everything. If I just attack with the Pyromancer, it's kind of a suspicious attack, right? So I'm going to attack like this to try and bait them into blocking with the Shredder, but they don't fall for it. Um, but instead, we'll bring back the Bloodgast here, and then I think I'm just going to sack the Bloodgast and go face here, then just tr tr try and start applying pressure to their life total, which should hopefully force them to keep the Shredder back to block. Obviously, we have fewer creatures in play, but... You know, they're not too far away from 10 life, which would then mean that the blood cast, the, sorry, the blood cast keeps getting haste when we bring it back. Plus, we've got this Den of the Bugbear here as well, which, you know, can represent a lot of damage if they do choose to attack with the Shredder. 
Okay, they go for consider and sleight of hand. I mean, obviously, you know, the other dynamic with unlicensed hearse in this matchup is you can preemptively use the hearse to try and shut off treasure crews, which it looks like is what they have here. But I think that's a mistake in the majority of cases because if you do that and then they just go looting into two phoenixes, you just get punished so hard by it. So even though we are allowing them to treasure crews here, I think hearse's main job in this matchup is to just keep them off lightning. Uh, sorry, keep them off. Um, what am I saying? Uh, Arc Light Phoenix itself. But we're in a really good spot here, right? The Sorin's not dead yet. They're already at 12. So we could potentially start crewing the hearse up here. They've only got access to one red mana here, which, you know, the vast majority of interaction that Phoenix can run isn't going to be able to take out the hearse here. But I feel like hearse leaves us vulnerable to fading hope into Phoenixes the following turn, right? So even though it probably is is safe for me to fire up the hearse, which, you know, is going to represent a lot more damage here, especially when we combine it with the, the Sorin Helix mode. I feel like even if we wait an extra turn, we're basically guaranteed to win here anyway, and firing up the hearse does leave us vulnerable to Fading Hope, which Phoenix basically never runs, but I feel like we're so far ahead that I might as well play around the, the outside chance card here, because, you know, we're, we're basically not worried about waiting an extra turn there's no way they can kill us here especially with the hearse in play right they could maybe go a braid into looting double phoenix but even then they have to leave back blockers even then we have land bring back blood ghast so maybe maybe i'm supposed to just fire up the hearse because i think it's it's so unlikely that they do have um fading hope but like i said i feel like it's relatively safe and i would, I would rather play around more things in, in a spot like this it's close, though. So they, they continue to dig. They're probably just trying to find an abrade, but even then, I don't think it's going to be good enough. Right. If they abrade now and then looting into two phoenixes, we're still in a pretty good spot. They're at five, so they constantly have to keep their creatures back to block. And then, you know, stuff like bombardment off the top is really tricky for them to beat. So get to exile more stuff from their graveyard. Obviously, you're going to exile the looting to cut off the flashback. And then again, I think we're just trying to keep them off delirium outside of that. So get the blood gas back, and then again we could fire up the hearse. But you know, I, I again, if I was playing around fading hope last turn, I think we can afford to play around it again here. Again, we're, we're at twenty three, right? We don't really have to worry about them winning on the crack back, and then we can cast our lucky witness, and then just ship it back again. We've got another land in hand to bring back the blood gas, even if they have something like a brotherhood's end. So. Looking at it now, though, maybe it was a mistake for me to not fire up the hearse, because like I said, the only thing we're really playing around in that spot is Fading Hope, and I didn't anticipate the game would, you know, it, we were giving them a lot of looks to find a braid into looting here, which is another way they could win. Okay, thankfully it doesn't matter, but I'll definitely watch this one back to see if I should have crewed the hearse up a little bit earlier, but either way we got there. Okay, so we're going second here. And I uh, can't keep a one land, especially when it's not a dual land. This hand, I think we can keep, right? We've got Unlucky Witness into Bloodgast, into Sorin Sack. The Bloodgast, which is, you know, not the fastest curve out, but it should do, I think. Okay, so Sing Gigantha and a uh, an Izzet dual land. Almost certainly going to be against um, Izzet Wizards here, if I had to guess. Thankfully, no creature on one, which is pretty big, especially when our hand is, is kind of slow here, so... Going to run out the Unlucky Witness on turn one. I'm going to choose to run it off the Sulphur Springs, which does deal us a damage, but I probably want to play this pathway on black to go for Bloodgast next turn. And I think going for Bloodgast is more important than Bombardment here because, yeah, especially if they play a creature here, we really want to be able to go Bloodgast into Sorin to, you know, use the Lightning Helix mode to take out one of their creatures here. So Double Symmetry Sage is scary to see, right? That does represent a lot of damage if they have a fast or, you know, a, a powerful turn here, but... You know, hopefully they don't have a crazy turn and then we can resolve Sorin, use the Bloodgast to sacrifice the Symmetry Sage, and then with only one creature in play, they might struggle to immediately attack down the Sorin, which would then enable us to bring back the Bloodgast and to take down the next Symmetry Sage. And, you know, I'm, Flame of Anora is obviously good against us, but it's uh, not another creature, which is pretty important, I think. We do have a chance of winning this game now, even though we had a relatively slow start, I think. So 
I'm going to choose to shock in the Blood Crypt over the Mount Doom here because I feel like Mount Doom is going to deal us more damage over the course of the game. Could be slightly wrong on that, but either way, we play the Sorin, sacrifice the Blood Gas, take out the Symmetry Sage, and then unless they have a way to take out the Symmetry Sage, we can just play Den, get back the Blood Gas, activate the Sorin again, take out the Symmetry Sage, which would be pretty big. Okay, there's Arcanist. Hopefully they don't have the Reckless Charge. Okay, they do have the Reckless Charge, which is pretty rough. So now they can also Flame of an to draw to as well. They also get to take out the... Uh, the Sorin here, which is kind of rough, so... Yeah, that was what I was kind of scared of. If they'd had a turn where they don't have uh, another creature into Reckless Charge, then Sorin could survive here, or, you know, they would potentially have to use a Wizard's Lightning on the Sorin, which is obviously another burn spell that's not going to use against one of our creatures, or going face, for example, so... Unfortunately, Sorin does go down, which is a pretty big deal in this spot. We draw another land, that's kind of rough, so we at least get Bloodgast back and we can play the Bombardment here, but, you know, I think Bombardment is usually too slow. The, the The way Bombardment is effective against Wizards is if you can keep them off their early creatures in the first two turns with something like a Fatal Push or like a Sorin like we saw there, and then when they've only got one creature at a time or something, or you have time to build up more creatures, then Bombardment comes online a lot, a lot more quickly, but, yeah, I think we're just dead here, right? They Bloodgast obviously can't block. They've turned the Dreadhold Arcanist into a 6-3. They can flash back the uh, the Reckless Charge. So yeah, unfortunately they, they still gain one there. We did draw quite a lot of lands and had a slow start and still had a reasonable shot if the Sorin survived here. But either way, post sideboard, uh, you know, I've been sideboarding like this for a while. Bring in the removal spells, cut the Shambling Ghast and cut a couple of Bombardments. I still think Bombardment has its place in this matchup. But like I said, I think... It's likely too slow in the early few turns. You really need to rely on your Fatal Pushes, Shove Asides, and Shield Edicts, and also Sorin to keep them off their early creatures. And then once you have time to build up a board with stuff like Season Pyromancer and stuff like that, that's when the, the Bombardment can come online a little bit later in the game. But going into game two here, we're going to be on the play, and we have more removal in the deck. I, I, I do feel like this matchup gets definitely better after Cyborg for sure. So this hand isn't bad, right? We've got Bloodgast into Sorin again. We really need to find our third land, though, is the, the big issue with this hand. Right, if we, if we miss land drops, then we could be in trouble, but we've got quite a few draws at it. Okay, if, if, if I'm not going to draw a land, then I do think removal is better. So here, even though I kind of want to play Bloodgast so that Sorin is better, I really want to use a removal spell here, and I like going for Shove Aside. Or I, I like playing this pathway on red because... It enables Shove Aside into Fatal Push here, which is a pretty nice curve. But it also enables us to play Season Pyromancer if we draw a third land. Okay, unfortunately we didn't draw a third land, so attacking with the Unlucky Witness here. And then, going to play the Bombardment. And then I think I'm going to Bombardment main phase to try and find a, uh, a third land. If they use a removal spell here, we still get... Oh, okay, it's a Spike Field Hazard, yikes. Okay, so that's pretty annoying. We really need to find a third land here or we're going to be in trouble. Okay, thankfully they have to use Iteration here to dig. That Shove Aside killing the uh, the Symmetry Sage definitely slows them down. And this is the sort of spot where, where Bombardment can be good, right? We've used an early removal spell to take out one of their creatures. Now we can get, you know, get some creatures in place so Bombardment becomes online. So Epicure, again, missing land drops is rough, but Epicure isn't too bad here because we get another look at a land and we can get Bloodgast in the graveyard. And we find it. So now I feel we're in a pretty good spot, right? Not only that, but we can also start applying pressure to their life total. And we've got Fatal Push to keep them off the board as well. So I actually feel pretty good about this spot. We've also got Bloodgast plus Sorin now as well, which is obviously, you know, we saw from last game that that can be really, really effective against Wizards because all of their creatures are three or less toughness. And obviously gaining life back off the Helix ability is huge, right? We saw when Wizards was really popular, some people used to run just like Control as a good counter because the actual card Lightning Helix was good against them. So obviously Sorin plus Bloodgast is really solid against them as well. Okay, so they cast the Symmetry Sage. I'm kind of hoping they tap out here. So I think if they tapped out, I would probably use this Sorin as a way to kill the Symmetry Sage instead. But yeah, okay, specifically because of Spell Pierce, I like going for Fatal Push now because if they choose to Spell Pierce the Fatal Push, we get to resolve the Sorin. Oh, wow, okay, we drew the Vein Ripper. Okay, that changes things. I think now we just minus the Sorin. I was just going to Sorin and use the Helix ability, which would still put us ahead, but... 
in this spot, I feel good. We can definitely attack with the Blood Guards. Actually, hold on. We're probably supposed to attack with the Epica as well, because there's a good chance we can just race to their life total. Because if they choose to block either creature, we can just use the Bombardment to take it out, right? Even if they block the Epica, we can sack the Blood Guards and the Epica to take out the Symmetry Sage. So that was a mistake on my part. I missed the point of damage there. Like, I assume they probably wouldn't block either, but I should have attacked with both to, you know, just get in for an extra point of damage. And, and if they did choose to block... The Bombardment line does deal a lot of damage to them, right, as well, because of the Vayne River passive. Okay, there's Snap Custom Mage. Thankfully, they don't have Flame of Nora in the graveyard. Are they going to flashback Iteration here, maybe? Wait, they, f they go for Spike Field Hazard, so maybe they're hoping that we just don't use the Bombardment here, maybe? I mean, we'll just sacrifice the Blood Gust, take out this, the Snap Custom Mage, which drains them for four. So... Yeah, I think I think opponent was just hoping that I would make a mistake there, I guess. So that felt pretty good. Going into game three, you know, I was happy with sideboarding. We don't really change play or draw with how we sideboard in this matchup, really. But I have felt like this matchup has been pretty good overall. Obviously, Wizards is such a powerful deck that sometimes their hand is just going to beat yours. But on the whole, especially post-sideboard, when you have, you know, eight cheap removal spells, you've got Sorin into Vein Ripper, which they obviously have Flame of a Nought as an answer to Vein Ripper, but... It's still not a, a blowout of an exchange, really, because at worst, it kills one of their creatures and you drain them for four, and it just buys you time. So this hand, you know, mainly keeping off the back of Fatal Push, but we do have a pretty reasonable uh, hand outside of that. I think Witness plus Deadly Dispute is really good at helping us assemble our synergies, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this start, especially when the opponent doesn't have a creature on turn one or two, which is very rare to see from Wizards. Maybe they're... But if they're holding up in Spellpish, should it safe for them to tap out? I don't know. I'd be interested to see what their hand is. So here, I'm going to play around Spellpish. I, I think it's important for our proactive hand to be good that we do resolve this deadly dispute here. So I'm going to do it now while the opponent doesn't have access to mana for Spellpish. So obviously, hitting Vein Ripper off Witness isn't ideal at this point in the game anyway when we don't have access to a lot of mana. But we still hit a land, so we've still got a playable card off it. Okay, opponent taps out. So here, I think I'm just going to play a Blood Gas. We could obviously play the second one, but I think with a with this with this Vein Ripper in hand now, I really want to save this treasure to be able to hard cast Vein Ripper if we keep hitting lands off the top here. Okay, they go for Arcanist, which we obviously have multiple answers for at this point, which is pretty nice. But oh, interesting to see they've also not running Gigantha. Okay, they go for Reckless Charge, which I'm very happy to see. We can shove aside. Even if they have Spell Pierce, we can just crack the treasure to use Fatal Push here. So I'm kind of surprised they kept in um, Reckless Charge against me. We ha we are running a lot of instant speed interaction, but I guess, you know, the opponent doesn't necessarily know what we're running. But we are a pretty interactive heavy deck, so I'm kind of surprised they, they kept that in. Okay, they go for Iteration again. So, I mean, opponent did keep a fairly creature-like hand, but we've got all the answers here, right? We've got we've got three removal spells now, and we can hard cast Vayner for next turn, which I assume they're not going to have any answers for, right? Um, because the only counter spell they tend to run is stuff like Spell Pierce, which only hits non-creatures. So, here, definitely going to use the Shield of Zedek, because they're tapped out. We don't, you know, we, we know we're not going to need another removal spell this turn. And they don't run any bigger creatures, as far as we're aware. So now we get to cast the Vein Ripper, get to attack him with the Blood Gas, and now I'd be very surprised if the opponent has a way out of this, right? Their only way to answer Vein Ripper would be to go creature into Flame of Anor, and even then I still feel like we're in a great position, right? That puts them down to six because they drain for four, and then we've got Blood Gas in hand, so yeah, end up taking it down, so we got there, nice. Okay, so we're on the play here, and yeah, this hand looks decent to me. Obviously, we would prefer to have something on turn one, but this hand's still pretty reasonable, right? We get to go Bombardment into Season Pyromancer, pitching Blood Gas, which is always a nice curve out, and then, you know, depending on what we draw, we could potentially keep this Vein Ripper for if we find Sorin, or, you know, if we want to, if there's other stuff that we want to keep, we could potentially pitch the Vein Ripper to the Pyromancer to get an extra token in play for the Bombardment. Ha, okay, interesting. So they're running Lorien Revealed and Thundering Falls. So could this be Creativity, maybe? Or, uh, you know, Jeskai Control? Oh, Looting. Is this Phoenix? I hope it's not, like, a super all-in graveyard deck like uh, Mizzix Mastery or something like that, because 
Game one is going to be really difficult if that is what we're up against. I mean, we do have Thought Seize, we do have Hearse in the sideboard, so we do have good counterplay post sideboard to that, but, you know, you need to draw those cards for to win those sorts of matchups. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, maybe there's a chance they're just running... Oh, okay, Thing in the Ice. Okay, so they're probably just on a, you know, a more controlling build of Phoenix, potentially. Oh, wow, okay. Soren's a sick draw here. I mean... If they are in a more controlling version of Phoenix, then I feel like they could obviously have Spell Pierce here, but if they are in a more controlling build, then... I don't know. I feel like we've just got to jam the Sorin here, right? If they have Spell Pierce, they have Spell Pierce. If not, we massively increase our chances of winning here. Right. Because the longer we wait, I mean, Phoenix holding open blue mana doesn't necessarily mean spell pierce. Again, Phoenix isn't doesn't typically run spell pierce in that high numbers from my experience. This could very well be an opt. Could very well be considered. Okay, it resolves. That's huge. So, the one issue with the thing in the ice here is obviously thing in the ice can get around um, the vein ripper ward ability by bouncing everything. So we have to kill the thing in the ice now. I think before they have a chance to just chain a bunch of spells together, because presumably they have an instant or sorcery here, which puts it down to three counters. They could have three instants to be able to trigger at instant speed. And it's really important here to... You want to go to your end step before sacrificing the Unlucky Witness, because if you sacrifice the Unlucky Witness during your end step, then you get to play the cards until your next end step, which means that they don't just get wasted. So if you are thinking of sacrificing Unlucky Witness during your turn, and you can do it at instant speed, always doing it, always do it during your end step. But yeah, this is a very great start from us, right? We get to sacrifice our whole board, take out the thing in the ice, and we also get, um, you know, four Vein Ripper triggers here, which already puts them down to nine, and then, you know, again puts them down to, to seven here. And now we should be good to win, I think, right? They'd need Lightning Axe to be able to take out the Vein Ripper, which would require another creature in play. We can obviously plus the Sorin to turn Vein, Vein Ripper into a 7-6. If we draw a land, we can get back... Uh, we, we can create two tokens off the Pyromancer, which we can then sacrifice to the Bombardment for six extra damage between the Bombardment and the Vein Ripper. So I think their only way... Actually, they could go Faithless Looting into Double Phoenix here as a potential out, but... Even that, I think, isn't going to be good enough, right? We have so many good draws here. Yeah, okay, opponent just scoops it up. So that was a nice one because Phoenix... I feel like Phoenix is a trickier matchup than Wizards from my experience. I've typically beaten Wizards the majority of the time. And, you know, Phoenix can be a little trickier if they have fast Phoenix starts because we can't defend against that very well unless we have Vayne Ripper down quickly as well. Mainly just because their Phoenixes are obviously very resilient to our removal right they can just keep coming back from the graveyard over over and over again and the only ways we have to defend against fires is exactly vein ripper but i found both matchups to be to be good on the whole to be fair we have a lot of ways to interact i think it just comes down to whether they have a nut draw and we have a slow draw is the main way that, that you end up losing those matchups so this hand i'm pretty happy to keep hearse on two is always going to be good against phoenix just because it shuts down those fast starts that i was just talking about so gonna lead on the unlucky witness and then Almost certainly just going to be jamming the hearse on turn two, especially because, you know, you want to have your graveyard hate in play going into their turn three, because that's when they can, you know, get the phoenixes back from the graveyard. Okay, they go for sleight of hand. And they're tapped out here as well, so we don't have to worry about spell pierce, which is pretty huge. So just going to jam the hearse out here, like I said. And then obviously drawing a land off the top would be nice, but you know, worst case scenario, we can just main phase the deadly dispute. And then we've got four looks at a potential land. Obviously they could have spell pierce, but we're basically guaranteed to get the at least the two cards off witness, which gives us an extra two looks at it for a start, which is pretty big. So now they're looting. Again, we're not too concerned about Phoenix. They could have tre uh, treasure cruise here potentially, but I I always think it's just way too risky to preemptively activate the hearse because then you just risk you know the main thing we're worried about is the phoenixes. Treasure cruise obviously helps them pull out on card advantage, but the actual cards that beat us are the arc like phoenixes themselves. So those are the things you should prioritize using the hearse. And I think okay, so we did draw the third land, which is nice. It means we don't have to main phase the deadly dispute. Get to cast out the unlucky witness here. And then just going to attack in. And then we can Deadly Dispute during the opponent's end step. Or, you know, if they choose to use removal against one of the witnesses for whatever reason, we can just use it in response. So, yeah, I feel pretty good about this spot. My main concern here is that they have an answer to the hearse. They could use a braid or something. Okay, they use Brotherhood's End. Oh, they use it on creatures. I thought they were going to use that to take out the hearse. I mean, that's fine, right? We get, we get 
eight looks off these unlucky witnesses, and we get two draws off the deadly dispute as well. Yeah, I thought they would use the, the Brotherhood's end to take out the hearse here, but they, they choose to take out the unlucky witnesses, which I'm completely fine with, right? So now we can use the hearse again. You know, keep their graveyards small so that they're less likely to be able to use treasure crews. And then I think at the moment we're just focusing on keeping them off delirium with our hearse activations. So here we want to use both of our unlucky witness piles if possible. So going to play them. And then I think, again, I'm interested in just using the deadly dispute here. We could use the bombardment, but I don't really think there's any rush to get that in play, really. Ah, okay, now they use Brotherhood's End to take out the hearse. So that kind of makes sense why they use the other one to take out the unlucky witness. But either way, we're going to use, we're going to crack the treasure first. Then use the hearse again. You know, we want to keep them off delirium. We want to keep them off treasure cruise as well. So they do, do take out the hearse, which is a bit of a concern because now their phoenix is alive. But now we're getting to the point where bombardment can just keep the phoenixes off the board anyway. Right, because we can go bombardment into season pyromancer, which starts making tokens. And then we can just start sacrificing our creatures. You know, we only need two creatures to take out a phoenix. So really limits their ability to race us, basically. So now we're going to use a deadly dispute before we lose the the black mana that we tapped for. Not the best hits off either of those really, but you know this is why season pyromancer is so good. It just really really solid at fixing our hand. So since we've already got a lot of lands, I think we're definitely going to play the epicure off the the unlucky witness here. I'm going to play the bombardment first here though because of spell pierce. Obviously, we don't want to risk. Um, having it countered because this is the main card that is going to keep them off their phoenixes from this point onwards i think and getting bombardment in play is huge specifically against an is it deck because they just have no way to deal with enchantments from this point so definitely going to be discarding two lands to the f to the pyromancer here you know obviously getting an extra token in play would be nice for the bombardment but you know with this many lands it's, re it's really nice to just filter them away we obviously want to keep the fatal pushes here and then keeping the second season pyromancer is really nice because even if we do draw more lands like we have here we can just you know filter them away with the with the pyromancer if we if we can uh, so they did find two phoenixes off the prankster which is obviously very good for them which is a little bit of a concern but we're at 17 and we've got a we've got a bombardment in play with two fatal pushes and a pyromancer so i'm still not too concerned especially because we've got hive of the eye tyrant here we can potentially go you know, Bombardment, Trigger trigger Revolt, Fatal push one of the Phoenixes, fire up Hive, and then get it out of the graveyard as a potential way to just slow their recursion engines down a little bit. Okay, so they do Unholy Heat the Pyromancers. That, that's their third spell. So they do get back both Phoenixes here, but... So that does take us down to 11, but I still feel like we're in a good spot here, right? We just need to be careful to ensure that we don't get overrun by these Phoenixes. Okay, so we go down to 11... Oh, wow, okay. Vein Ripper is a sick draw here, so that's just going to be the turn. Cast the Vein Ripper. Having said that, I still think we had a pretty good turn outside of that. We can just go, like I said, attack with the Epicure. Um, actually, I probably should have attacked with the Epicure first, because they probably wouldn't use the Unholy Heat preemptively there anyway. That was maybe a slight sequencing error from me. But yeah, regardless, even if I didn't draw the Vein Ripper, we can go sacrifice the Epicure, trigger Revolt, kill the Phoenix, fire up the Hive and attack. Thing in the Ice, again, I'm not too concerned about because we can just recast the Vein Ripper and it bounces the Phoenixes back to their hand if they do go for it as well. Looks like they're exiling stuff from their graveyard, so yeah, they do have a Treasure Cruise here, but if they don't have a way to take, you know, they would need to have three, they would need to draw exactly, are they, they could, they, they, I was going to say they would need exactly three one mana uh, instants here, but they would also need an additional land, so I don't think there's any way they can flip Thing in the Ice this turn, and if they, if they don't flip Thing in the Ice this turn, I think they just lose next turn, right, because because we have, you know, we can trigger a vault with the blood token, we can double push the phoenixes, and then season pyromancer for the win, I think, well, I mean, we have to prioritize taking out the Thing in the Ice regardless, um, and then Gonna cast the Sorin here. Gonna plus on the Vein Ripper and then attack. And if they choose to double block, we can just crack the Blood Token, trigger a vault, and kill one of the Phoenixes. And then, even though this doesn't kill them this turn, it basically just guarantees that they can't win the game from this point onwards. Should th actually, thinking about it, was there a way I could have guaranteed a win this turn? If we'd gone, 
crack the blood token, double push the phoenix's attack with the vein ripper, that might have done it, and then we can sacrifice stuff to the bombardment, so yeah, maybe, maybe I, yeah, that was maybe a, a misplay, maybe I did have lethal that turn, but, I mean, I don't think it really matters here, I don't think there's any way that they can feasibly win from this point onwards anyway, even if they drew absolutely perfectly, right, because to, to kill the vein ripper, they would need, like, Double Brotherhood's End or Creature into Lightning Axe. And we just sacrifice the Vein Ripper to the Bombardment, which puts them down to six. And then we can go Pyromancer, discard the Blood Ghast, sacrifice the Blood Ghast, or, we, you know, Blood Ghast, sacrifice to Sorin, then Pyromancer from, you know, our hands. There, there's, there's a ton of different lines, I think. So I probably should have played a little bit slower last turn to figure out if there was Leaf. And I'll definitely watch that turn back to, to try and figure it out. But. I think we're so far ahead at the, at the moment that it shouldn't end up mattering, hopefully. So opponent does get back two Phoenixes. Presumably, they're forced to attack down the Sorin here, but we should still easily win, I think. Yeah, so here we can go Season Pyromancer, discard both. Oh, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm going to lead on the Unlucky Witness because then we at least get the... Um, you know, we get the death trigger off the unlucky witness. Now we can sacrifice three creatures to take out the the prankster, drain them for a bunch, and then just attack in for lethal. Uh, just trying to think the best way to sequence this. So take out the the prankster. Yeah, opponent just scoops up. So I did maybe misplay a couple of turns ago, but thankfully was so far ahead that it just didn't end up mattering there.